it's quite an honor to be able to speak here at, 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 at Crown College. And Dr. Sexton asked me to tell you about my life. But first, first I'd like to ask you a question. I have a $100 bill right here. And who would like to have this $100 bill? Okay, okay. Now, I've crumbled it all up. See, it's just like that. Who would still like to have the $100 bill? Okay. Now, um, I am. Uh, I, I, I want to share something with you that uh, I think might be very valuable to it. We've learned a very valuable lesson here that no matter no, no matter what I did with the money, I could stomp on it and and you still want it because it didn't decrease in value. It was still worth a hundred dollars. Many times in our lives we we were, uh, have uh, dropped and, and, and crumbled and ground in the dirt with our decisions we make and the circumstances that, that come our way. And we, uh, we feel as we're just worthless. Uh, no matter what has happened or what will happen, you will never lose your value. Dirty, clean, crumbled, you are still priceless to those who love you. God loves you no matter what. The worth of our lives does not come in who we are or who we know, but by uh, whose we are. You, you're special. Don't forget it. Don't ever forget it. Count your blessings, not your problems. Remember, Amateurs built the ark. Professionals built the Titanic. Remember, if God, if God brings you to it, God will bring you through it. I was born in Richmond, Indiana. You know, first, I'd just like to pray. Is that all right? Let's all bow our heads and let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, as I'm about to speak to these people here today. Lord God, I pray that you'll spill, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that I speak to, them with, speak to them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, if I speak to them with my words, they'll just fall to the ground and, and mean nothing. But Lord, if I speak to them with your words, they'll penetrate hearts and mean everything. Now, Lord God, I just pray that each and every word I say will be your words coming through my body. And Lord, I pray that you, these children or these young people will be able to use them to bring honor and glory and praise to you. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen. I was born, I was born in Richmond, Indiana. Richmond is located between Indianapolis, Indiana and Dayton, Ohio, right on the Indiana-Ohio line. When I was young, my mother used to take my two sisters and I. She'd take us to church almost every Sunday. And, and when I got out of school, when I got out of school, I didn't go to church. I didn't go to church for probably 20 some years. I was raised on a farm. You know, when I was, when I was in 11th grade, my, my father had a nervous breakdown and he was, uh, he was put in an asylum for a while. Uh, he couldn't work. Uh, um, he, he, he would only talk to my mother and my sisters and I, that's all he talked to. Uh, we had to move off the farm. You know, and we had to move in the city. My mom got a low paying job as an attendant at the mental hospital. And they would physically fight her. And she just had to take it because she didn't have skills to get a better job. And someone, someone had to pay the bills. And my dad, he couldn't work. I went to college for a year and a half. And then, then I ran out of money. I tried my best to get a job in Richmond and couldn't find one. I saw an ad in the Indianapolis newspaper that said, uh, you could want a scholarship to go to college. So I drove to Indianapolis and I found out it was a job selling encyclopedias door to door. It was straight commission. I took the job because no one else offered me a job doing anything. I uh, went over that night to get my car out of the parking garage and 
this has been 50 some years ago, but maybe it was $1.50 and, and I had maybe only 96 cents. And I told the guy, I said, I'll give you every penny I've got if you'll let me have my car. And I'll come back Friday and pay the rest of it as soon as I get paid. I didn't tell him what I was going to get with street commission, <laughs> but he didn't think he'd see me anyhow on Friday. But I'll tell you one thing he did. I, uh, I found my gas gauge was clear on empty, just right on the peg. And there was a gas station right across the street, and I pulled in, and I told the man, I said, sir, if you'll give me some gas, I said, I'll come back and I'll pay you for it Friday. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. He never said a word, and he went back in the building. Well, I knew I wasn't going to get any gas. And I looked down the street, and I saw YMCA about two or three blocks, and I thought, well, I'll see if my car will go that far. And, and, and I got there, and the room, the room didn't cost very much, but I didn't, have, I didn't have a penny. I told the man I would pay him Friday. He said he had several people was going to do that and didn't, and, and he wouldn't let me stay there. I stood on the steps of the YMCA, and I remembered a 24-hour restaurant we'd eaten in that day, and I was about three blocks from there, and I thought, well, I'll walk over there, and I'll see if they'll let me sit in the back, sit in the back and just spend a night there. And when I got there, I saw a man that applied for the job the same place I did that day. I went over to him, and I told him, I said, sir, I am so very embarrassed to tell you this, but I don't have any money. I, I don't even have a penny. Uh, I don't have a place even to sleep tonight. I asked him, if you would loan me some money, I sure would appreciate it. And he loaned me seven dollars. As the years went by, I always wondered who he was. And years went by, and I couldn't remember. And I thought, maybe it was an angel. It was, uh, seven's God's number, you know. And I got a letter in the mail several years later. And he said, I don't know if you remember me or not, but I'm the guy that loaned you seven dollars. Well, I called him, and I wanted to meet with him right away, and I did. And uh, he uh, worked for Ford Motor Company for 40 years, and he was an inspector all that time. And he's still working at Ford Motor Company. And he told me, he told me that he just built a new home. I said, sir, tell me what your mortgage is on it, and I'll pay it off. You won't owe a dime. He, uh, Tom, uh, I've already got it paid for. I said, well, tell me how much you owe on your cars, and I'll pay them off for you. Well, Tom, uh, uh, I've already got them paid for. Well, when I really need some help, he helped me, and I was going to try to help him. I certainly didn't forget it. Well, when I got the $7, I went back to the YMCA and got a room. It didn't cost very much. That week, that week, they, they take you out and and drop you off in a city, and one on 1st Street, 2nd, 3rd Street, and they drop you off maybe at 5 o'clock, pick you up at 10 o'clock, you just knock on doors, you know, and you're just selling encyclopedias. Well, that week, I was the number one, uh, or tied for number one salesman in the office. In three weeks, I became the number one salesman in three states. Week after week, I'd usually be the number one salesman in our office, I told, I told my manager that I was, I was going to get a job at the International Harvester Motor Truck Division. Well, the encyclopedia people, they sent a vice president down to Indianapolis to try to get me to stay. I was, I was their best producer. Uh, they, were, they were going to give me a, a, an office of my own with several salesmen if I just stay. And I told them, I said, I want to thank you for that so much, but really I want to go in a different direction. And I took the lowest job in the office at the International Harvester Motor Truck Division. The man that hired me asked me, said, how much money do you want us to pay you? I said, sir, I don't want you to pay me anything for the first 30 days. Don't pay me a dime. At the end of 30 days, I'd appreciate if you just pay me whatever you think I'm worth. He's probably never heard that before or since. Well, anyhow... Uh, uh, I, uh, as I worked there, I, I, there's, they hired a, a person at the same time I did, and accounts receivable. 
and it was three months behind. And they called me in the office and said, we want you to go on accounts receivable, Tom. And, and I said, I don't want to do that. Why not? That guy's a friend of mine. I don't want to put him out of work. Tom, if you don't take that job, uh, we're going to have to terminate him, and he won't have a job at all. But if you take that job, we're going to give him your job. I said, well, that makes a lot of difference. I said, I have, I've had algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, and it wasn't hard for me. But I've never had any accounting. And you need to know that. Well, they said, Tom, we think that you can do that. So anyhow, I got on the accounts receivable. And about every 25, 20, 25 minutes, a collector would come down and just chew me out really good because he just got chewed out really good because the accounts receivable showed that people owed, owed money and they're going to forfeit this, they're going to sue this guy, and, all, and these people call, and he was just having an awful hard time. And I told him, I said, you know, sir, you come down here about every 25, 30 minutes, and I said, I've got something about figured out, and you just blow my mind. And then I start getting, and then you come down and blow my mind again. You come down there about every 20, 25 minutes. Now, I'll tell you, if I were you, I wouldn't do that. If I were you, I'd probably be coming down here about every five or ten minutes. Because I know, I know it's really hard what you're doing. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Don't talk to me for 30 days. Don't say hi, don't say goodbye. Don't say anything to me for 30 days. And I'll have this caught up for you. Well, I'm 18 years old. And he was 40-some, and my boss is 40-some, and they talked to each other, and they finally said, uh, uh, we're going to do that. And so in 30 days, I had it all caught up. And as time went on, I became the youngest zone manager in the history of the International Harvester Motor Truck Division. The youngest one they had anywhere. And like a person calls on the Ford Motor Company, someone else calls on the Chevrolet uh, dealer, I called on International Harvester Motor Truck Dealers. The first year I was there, I tied for, or I didn't tie, I was a, a made a zone manager's what they call Penetrators Club. And out of all the zone managers, I was the only one that made it. And so they had some guys that had been there 15, 20 years, and they had them say, just put it on earth, they made it. They didn't want me to know I was the only one that made that. Well, I found it out later on, and, and, uh, but, but uh, as I talked to these zone managers, I found out they're still making car payments. Uh, they're making house payments. You know, they're making other payments. And I knew, I knew that I wasn't going to get rich there. So I worked there for about five years. And then I decided I want to go in business myself. I said, I'm, I'm going to quit. What are you going to do? I'm going in business for myself. What kind of business are you going in? I said, I don't know. So International Harvester, they, they called me in the office, my boss, why don't you start an International Harvester motor truck dealership? I said, sir, uh, I've been with you just a little over five years. You know exactly what I've made, and I'm so very thankful what you paid me. But quite frankly, what you paid me is about what it cost me to live. I don't have any money to start a truck dealership. Tom, Tom, we'll put up a brand new building. We'll finance everything 100%. You can manage it for a year, see if you want it, or you can own it from day one. I said, you know, I really appreciate that, and thank you very, very much, but that isn't what I want to do. And I was probably about the only person to turn a deal like that down. Well, two or three uh, uh, months later, someone else offered to back me in a car dealership. And I said, I'd want to do that in a town the size of Indianapolis or larger. And this man said, Tom, you find any new car dealership you want anywhere in the United States, and I'll put the money up. Uh, you'll get half the profit, I want half the profit, and I want a salary. And any time you can, any time you can, you can buy my half out. Well, I told him, I said, would you care if my father worked there? And now it's been about seven years, and, and Dad is now, he's doing a lot better, and he can talk to people and that. And I said, would you care if my father would work there? He said, well, he can work there, but any time I think that he's not working properly, he... Uh, uh, he's going to have to quit. And I knew right then I wasn't going to do it. So I went to Richmond, Indiana, my little hometown, and I, I started a used car lot. The only reason I went there was to give my dad a job. That's the only reason. I would have taken that car dealership in a heartbeat. 
but I wanted my dad. My dad was the, my best male friend I've ever had. And, and I was just so sorry that he had to go through what he went through. It was, it was hard on him. Well, uh, I started my business with $2,000. That's all I had. And, and the people at the international company said, Tom, don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. You're going to go broke. And I had other people tell me the same thing. No one encouraged me at all except my dad. And dad never knew the reason I, why, why I came here was to give him a job. I never, ever told him that. Well, I started in business with uh, $2,000. And I was, that was 50 years ago. I started in business April the 1st, 1964. Don't forget, don't forget to go out on a limb. That's where the fruit is. I went out on a limb, $2,000. And again, I asked my father to come to work with me. And I said, Dad, I'm not going to be able to pay you anything until I can make some money. Well, he wasn't working anyhow. But I want to tell you something. I made a good decision with my father. He was a tremendous help. Well, as time went on, I got into the recreational vehicle business as a dealer. We sold motor homes and travel trailers, fifth wheels, tent campers, and other trailers. After that, I got into the manufactured housing business. And we sold mobile homes and sectional homes and modular homes you just set with a crane. We became the largest manufactured housing dealer in the state of Indiana and Ohio. We became the largest recreational vehicle dealer in the United States. I sold more RVs than any dealer in California, Texas, uh, Florida, wherever. We sold more RVs, and we probably sold more RVs than any dealer in the world. I had a 60-acre complex, had five different buildings on it. I had 275 employees. Uh, it'd make a pretty good-sized church. We had to pay them every week. Also, we had to find a place to park 275 cars. My friends, my friends, God bless these businesses. I spent millions of dollars on advertising. I spent much of it on television. You know, we were on a station in Chicago that went into all 50 states. My controller told me one, one 12 month period of time, we sold in every state but two. We didn't sell in Rhode Island or we didn't sell in Hawaii. I hired a firm, I had a firm that's, that's supposed to help you guide your business and they did this for huge car dealers for several years. Why did someone buy, not buy from you? Why did they buy from your competition? And they guide you. Well, they called my general manager one day and they said, we can't believe this. What do you mean? Uh, we've never seen this happen to anybody before. Well, wh what are you talking about? You know, uh, uh, we deal with the largest car dealers in the United States half for years and we've never seen this happen. Well, sir, sir, what is it you've not seen happen? Tom Raper has, and I'm Tom Raper, Tom Raper has 100% name recognition in Indianapolis, Indiana, in Cincinnati, Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, and in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We've got huge car dealers. They don't even have 100% name recognition in the town they're in. Well, we, uh, we'd have people come to us from Germany and France and England and, and other countries to buy from us. And we had a huge inventory. One day we figured if someone would spend 10 minutes in each unit we had, he'd have to be there eight hours a day for almost four weeks to get through all the units. Well, I've, uh, I've had a few health problems. I, I, I broke my ankle. I had my gallbladder and my appendix taken out. I had to have half my left, room, left lung removed for cancer. I found out no, more people die of lung cancer than any other cancer. I had a kidney stone. Boy, that hurt. I had to have my left kidney removed for cancer. 
I had to go back in about a year later to see if it was healing property, properly. And while I was there, I got real sick. And I was in a hospital in Cleveland, Ohio for 21 days. Well, later I had melanoma cancer on my arm and had to have it surgically removed. And melanoma is the worst skin cancer you can get. Then I had melanoma cancer behind my ear, had to have it surgically removed. I had 104 degree temperature. And, and, and the doctor said, if you would have stayed home much longer, you probably would have died. I'm telling you, in having these things, I had a tremendous amount of pain. Then, then I broke my back. And, and the doctor looked at me and said, sir, you have a broken back. I said, do you think we'll ever walk again? Well, I don't know, but we're going to have an orthopedic surgeon check you tomorrow, and he'll be able to tell you. Well, I want to tell you, I was in so much pain. Oh, oh, did it hurt. And I thought, I thought I was going to die. And I was hoping that I would die. I didn't think I could stand another moment of that. I didn't ask God to heal me. I didn't ask God to take away the pain. I just asked God to forgive me for all my sins. I really thought I was going to die any moment. Well, the Lord used that to get my attention, and I sure hope he doesn't have to use that kind of get your attention. But I, 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 I told my wife, I said, I'd like to have a Bible. And she went, I got one for me. And I couldn't understand it very well. And, 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 and uh, I said, uh, we're going to have to go to church. I want to learn more about this Bible. And we've been going to church ever since. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, and it is appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment, it seems, it seems that the Lord was not ready to take me yet. My appointment was there yet. Uh, we now live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We've been there for about 10 years. About two years ago, we still have a home in Richmond, Indiana. We back, went back to Richmond. I had some business to do there. And, and I was going to be there three or four months. And it turned out I was there for, for a year and a half. And I just couldn't understand until this happened. I spoke at a church in Marion, Indiana, and there were 38 people saved. Then I went to a church and spoke in a church in Indianapolis, another church in northern Kentucky, another church in Dayton, Ohio, and there were 22 people saved in each one of those churches. Another church in Terre Haute, Indiana, we had over 40 people saved. Another church in Dayton, we had over 40 people saved there. I spoke at a basketball tournament at a, at a Christian college, and I think, I think there were probably at least 100 people saved there. I was told about a man that was in a hospital and he wasn't doing very good. And, and I went out to see him and, and, and he prayed and he asked Jesus to come to his heart and save his soul. Three days later, he died. As we know, all the honor and all the glory and all the praise goes to God. One time a person said, Tom, Tom, I want to thank you for saving me. I said, sir. I didn't save you. Jesus Christ saved you. God just used me to tell you what you need to do to be saved. Now, now, I know now why God kept me there. He wanted me to go to these churches. And if I'd have gone back in three or four months, I couldn't do it. Well, we came back to Fort Lauderdale about just a few months ago. And again, evidently, my appointment to die had... had uh, had not come yet. However, it was getting closer every day. I, uh, on my business cards, on the back of my business cards, I would put on there the plan of salvation. You know, and so every card I gave to people, I gave out lots and lots and all of them, 10,000 of them, that had the plan of salvation on the back of it. You know, and... And uh, I don't know how many people have been saved by that. But I think, why do you want to make a card and leave the back blank? You know, and especially, you know, if you're, <laughs> you're going to church and you want to see people get saved. I had a lady call me one day and she says, uh, Tom, 
uh, my husband knew he was going to die, and he had one of your cards, and I just want you to know he read that prayer on the back, and he read it and read it and read it, and finally, uh, he died. And my friends, um, if he didn't have that prayer, he'd probably be in hell right now. Well, uh, I, uh, I was not ever going to retire. I was going to work until I, I died or I couldn't do it anymore. I enjoyed the work I was doing. However, God told me to sell my businesses. When I told my wife and other people I was going to sell the businesses, they couldn't hardly believe it. I never ever talked about it. I was, I was never going to retire. Now I'm going to sell the business. But God told me to do that. Uh, the business is supposed to be sold to someone on May the 1st. And, and the deal fell through. And I was devastated because I didn't want to, I didn't have any desire to go to work anymore. In fact, I didn't. I stayed home. And I just have the general manager run it. One day, one day I was reading the Bible and I read Psalms 27, 14. It said, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I said, Lord, I'll wait. I felt that the Lord wanted me to sell this business to a certain person. And my attorneys and CPA said, Tom, you can sell your business to someone else for more money. I said, I know that. But I want to sell it to this person, and I'm going to wait. When he says he doesn't want it, then we'll go somewhere else. I had another man came by, and he had a whole lot of money. And he said, Tom, uh, Tom, we want to buy the business. Just tell us the price. I said, I'm sorry, but I'm going to wait. Uh, I'm going to wait on a man, and when he tells me he doesn't want it, then I'll put a price on it. I waited from May the 1st till April the 1st of the next year. And, and then I thought the deal was going through, and it fell through again. Lord, I'm still waiting. The deal fell through on May the 1st. I said, Lord, I'm still waiting. I, I said, I've been waiting now for a year. The deal fell through again on June the 1st. Then on June the 19th of 2002, the deal, the deal went through. Uh, my wife and I, we bought a condominium in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we've been there for about 10 years now. Uh, that's our official home now. We love it there. Uh, back home, boy, we'd have snow and ice. And when we'd have snow, I couldn't have someone plow the snow. Or it'd make big things and people couldn't get in the RVs. And so I had to have people come in with tandem axle dump trucks and haul the snow away. It would cost me 20 some thousand dollars every time I'd do that. But if I didn't do it, I had 275 people I'm paying. And we, we need to have people coming in and we need to be selling them. Well, well it's, it's, it's amazing how God has blessed those businesses, how he did. You know, I never mortgaged the property. I paid cash for uh, our entire inventory of recreational vehicles and manufactured homes. Some of the motor homes would cost me $250,000, $300,000 for just one of them. And, and I paid cash for all of them. I started out with $2,000. God allowed me to make money. We own, I'm telling you these for the honor and glory of God, I'm telling you this. Uh, we own some farms. I have two subdivisions. We own some commercial buildings. We own several houses. We also own 30, 135 acres on the interstate. We own another 50 acres on a different exit on the interstate. 3,200 feet of frontage on the interstate. Another five acres on the interstate. Another 50 acres on another exit on the interstate. We, uh, we never borrowed money on any of it. Paid cash for all of it. But you know something? I know it all belongs to the Lord. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. My friends, my friends, when we die, we're not able to take anything from the earth uh, to heaven. However, however, we can get treasure in heaven before we die. 
If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. I'll give you some time to find that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. The Bible says, Lay not of yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth uh, corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. If we want to put treasure in heaven, my friends, we have to do that before we die. When we die, it's too late. And that means probably ought to start doing it right away. Now, I want to talk to you about something here, and, and I know that many of you don't need this, but some of you might. I'm going to tell you how to save, uh, how to lead someone to Christ. And, and many times, if you tell them uh, do they want to be saved, they don't even know what you're talking about. You know, do you, you, you want to go to heaven? You know, and so anyhow... What I do, and this is the way I do it to save, to lead people to Christ, I take them to Romans 3.23. And Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They need to know they're a sinner. Then I take them to Romans 6.23. It says, it says um, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, if I'd offer you a gift, there's two things you could do. One, you could accept it. Or two, you could reject it. God says, here's my gift of Jesus Christ. If you accept this gift, you'll go to heaven. If you reject this gift, I'll have to judge you and you will go to hell. And he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. God wants everyone to go to heaven. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If thou shalt, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in thine heart that God hath raised the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is my desire. And oh, by the way, if you don't remember that, in the front of your Bible, the front page, put down Romans 3.23. And at Romans 3.23, write down Romans 6.23. And 6.23, write Romans 10.10. You never have to remember it. But you ought to memorize it because you might have to use it sometime. Now, it is my desire. It is my desire for the Lord to say to each and every one of us, well done, thou good and faithful servant.